Hickok 45 here, armed in 1917, Flanders Fields. You probably know what this is about. You know, we love our armed in series because generally speaking, we're just demonstrating what an individual, probably in the United States, might have as a three gun battery, handgun, rifle, shotgun, right? And it could be lots of choices. It could be, you know, 20 different really good choices. Yep. Military is a little different or a place. If we put this in a place like Flanders Fields, France, Belgium, uh, in wartime, a little different, more limited in what a person might have, be armed with, particularly all three you know, scenarios, shotgun, rifle, and handgun. And we know everybody wouldn't be carrying all three and often not even more than one, just depends, but might, but some would and have access to these three. So that's where we are today. 1917, World War I, Flanders Fields. And I hope you've read, heard the poem by John McRae, you know, Flanders Fields. I won't recite it today, maybe we'll play it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's where we are and uh, looking forward to talking about that year and don't know everything about it, but uh, got some firearms here, a uh, Smith & Wesson, Model 1917, all right? We all know there was a Colt counterpart to that, chambered in 45 ACP, that some troops carried. Some carried the 1911. This individual carried this for today, right? The Smith & Wesson Model 1917, 45 ACP. We'll talk about that. This individual also happened to have this fine rifle, this Model 1917. Uh, yeah, called many things, right? The uh, Enfield, American Enfield, the uh, Enfield 1917. It was even called the P-17, which was not really uh, very correct, right? <laughs> but uh, I think it was a what, US rifle, 30 caliber, model of 1917 or something like that, the long full uh, name and everything. 30 out six, a fine uh, rifle. Not my favorite, but a fine rifle. Okay, we'll talk a little about that. And then we have, of course, the trusty old model, 1897. John Browning had a hand in this, you know, especially in the 93, and then this is the evolution of it. And uh, so, who knew, who's surprised that John Browning might have had something to do with this, right? So the 1897, the 12 gauge, this one's been cut down. Uh, it started out as a longer hunting rifle, but a, a military version of it would look, you know, more like that, maybe with a heat shield, some other things. And they're very expensive if you find one, right? So that could that passes as a trench gun today. How's that? And a couple other adornments there. Got a, a an old uh, bolo knife from 1912, 1909 model, 1917 model. Okay, so you know, just a little table decoration there. Okay, I'm the other table decoration. Oh, I forgot we have a coin. Bought a coin, 1917, a quarter. Yeah, that was made in 1917. It's not in very good shape, but I tell you, most of them are not from 1917. So it was a interesting year, right? Eventful year. Uh, Woodrow Wilson started his second term. First streetcars hit the San Francisco, well, rails, not streets, right? Well, the streets. If you've been there, you know what it looks like, right? Uh, Walt Disney finished high school, graduated, I think, in 1917. Most importantly, I guess, the U.S. declared war on Germany in 1917. And uh, that's why we're Flanders Fields, where a lot of servicemen are buried, right? And the poppy fields growing above them. That's what inspired the poem, the famous poem, Flanders Fields. In, in, I think it's called In Flanders Fields, I believe is the title of that poem. Uh, but maybe I'll put it in the description, okay, for your edification. So... We won't belabor the point. We've done uh, some videos on all these firearms. I will link to all these firearms in the video, so that in the description. So that you, if you want to see full videos on on these firearms, uh, you can do that. But just kind of a, a brief idea. Again, in 1917, we all know that uh, Smith and Wesson and Colt, but they geared up and converted their popular revolvers and 45 ACP. Why, I wonder? Well, because it would be hoove everybody if it could fire the same ammo that the 1911 fired. And of course, we didn't have enough 1911s World War I. We enter the war. And so uh, Smith & Wesson had been working on that, I think a little bit before Colt. Uh, cham they chambered this uh, what second model, uh, not the triple lock, but it evolved from the uh, triple lock. 
and and chambered it in 44 special 45 colt 4440 i think maybe some others and so they just uh, worked on that dude and got it to chamber a 45 uh, acp and smith and wesson actually developed the clip and then they sold the rights or gave the rights to colt because the war was going on you know so that it would because uh, you don't have a, a rim on a 45 acp as many of you know uh it's rimless and so it would just fall on in there maybe if you Although in, in this farm, they, they will have space on the chamber so you can fire them even without the clips, as I've shown you. But in some, you couldn't. It would not. And uh, if it was chambered for 45 Colt, it would. If it was a 45 Colt, this thing would just go down in there about like that. You know, it wouldn't fire. All right, so they had to do some modifications, and they did. And made this one of the uh, World War I revolvers that uh, was very, very popular and well-liked. Uh, I mean... Let's face it, if Brad Pitt liked it, it must have been okay, right? And many of you know what I'm talking about in the movie Fury. This is exactly the gun he carried in a chest holster. He made it famous. <laughs> Actually, I think it was famous before that. Well, that's an interesting reaction <laughs> for a, a bottle, isn't it? How about this guy? Yeah, 45 ACP. Let's shoot the garbage can. And then that plate. Boom. Boom. Yeah, it's empty. And so when you're ready to empty it, it just, they all come out together. All right. And uh, so the same ammo, and if, I'm not an expert, but if you know much and can imagine much about wartime, you know, getting all the supplies to everybody is, is so important and critical and difficult. Uh, and so the fewer types of ammo you have, yeah, sure, you get it. Yeah, well, just, let's just, yeah, we'll just uh, take 100,000 of these, Smith & Wesson, make us some of those, 100,000 of them or 300,000 of them in 44 Special. Why not? Good cartridge. Well, you know, you're managing all that and different uh, ammo, it, it creates a problem, as we know from back in the 1800s with the 45 Schofield and 45 Colt, you know, the, the issues with that, the mix up, you know. So anyway, uh, 45 ACP, same ammo, quick to load, quick to unload, and handy. Yeah, pretty good size gun. Uh, not as handy maybe or quick to load and all that as a, uh, you know, 1911, but we didn't have enough 1911s, so. So this thing saw duty, this and the Colt. So anyway, that would be one firearm our imaginary uh, doughboy you know, could have carried, might have carried. Might have been an officer if he's carrying this. I, I don't know how many frontline troops had them. I know that it was just guns, guns. We, we need guns, of course. It was wartime. Seems like every time there's a, a major war like that, uh, we and other countries as well are caught without enough rifles or handguns or whatever, you know, which is a good transition as well. And so, again, as I was saying, transitioning to the rifle, we never have enough firearms when we need them. Same old deal, you know, it happens in, in current times, it happened back then, World War I, World War II. So, we had already adopted the Auth3 Springfield, right? In about 1906, something like that, with the 30-06 round. Well, that was uh, how many years, you know, before we entered, you know, uh, 10 years before we entered the uh, World War I, but we didn't have enough of them. And we needed more rifles, and it was going to take time to gear up and, and make more in a hurry. And uh, I think there were already some issues with the A3 Springfield there about that time with the receiver tempering of the steel, some things like that. They were experiencing some issues and had to, I think, stop production and, and work on that. Well, we needed rifles. It just so happened that we were making Winchester and Remington and, let's see, yeah, including a subsidiary, I guess, of Remington, uh, Eddystone, were making P-14s for Britain. I may not be right on that, Eddie Stone. I know Winchester and Remington were making the, the rifles for Britain. They're making the P-14. Uh, Britain was trying to come up with a new cartridge, you know, and they were moving away, they thought, from the SMLE into a, uh, a P-13 with, uh, it was, I was gonna fire a cartridge, it was a 27 caliber, uh, .276 or something, you know, which was probably a great cartridge. Well, war comes along, you know how that does. And then, uh, now nah, we don't have time to develop this. We need guns. And so 
the guns that we were making for them that were contracted with uh, Winchester and Remington, they just went ahead as well as we just need to stick with the uh, 303 right now, okay? The British ran 303. And so they did, they made the P-14 in 303, which is basically this gun in 303 and made, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of them, I think, for, you know, for Britain, all right? Well, they were just wrapping up those contracts as fate would have it, as we entered the war right around that time. And so we looked at getting Remington and uh, Winchester to maybe just start making all three Springfields quick as you can. But that was gonna take too much time to retool and gear up for that. So we evaluated the P-14, said, you know what? This is a fine rifle. How about when we just chamber this in, uh, uh, well, first of all, they thought about just, just taking it in 303 British. But then again, ammo issues and say, so, let's just see, could we chamber it in 30 out six? And uh, how long would that take? Anyway, that's what they did, long story short, right? That's why I have one right here. So we, uh, we, we had them just continue doing what you're doing, making the P-14 basically, which became the you know, American infield of 1917, and uh, 30 six. So they changed the bolt face and whatever, you know, chambering and everything. I wish it didn't take a lot of modifications. So it's available, it was available in 30 six, the same round that the aught three Springfield takes, right? And I have some right here. Same clip and everything. And uh, there it is. And I've got the, my extender on here. I'll let you look at it without the extender. But it, I, it just feels so much better to me with some length. And uh, so this rifle actually was more prevalent in World War I amongst our troops than the all three Springfield. I think like 70, 75% of our troops, as many as that, carried this thing in, in Europe. And it's not my favorite, but it's a pretty nice rifle. Shot low, I bet. Yeah, there we go. Right, right on target. How about a two liter here? It works on them too, doesn't it? And the gong. How about that red plate again? Boom. Yeah. I think I have. No, I don't have one more. Oh, you know what? That reminds me. It does actually hold six instead of five. I got five in those clips, and uh, I guess the military use the same clips, and uh, probably the most often loaded five. But you can put six in it because it was designed for this round. I start saying I meant to bring one out. I did bring one out, so I've got this funky clip out here. <laughs> you know, the three or three British uh, round, and it's rimmed. And it would just hold five of those, so they didn't really change the magazine configuration or size, I guess, much, if, if any. And, uh, and so it, it would hold five of those, but it would hold six of the 30 out six. How's that for cool? So, yeah, so it was it kind of loved and hated. Some soldiers, I think, liked it better than the all three Springfield. Some didn't like it as well. It's a little bit longer, a little bit heavier. In some ways, it's just a little more awkward. For me, it's a little more awkward. I prefer the Author Springfield a lot better. Although you got really uh, nice sights on this. You got longer sight radius. Now I'm talking about the original Author Springfield because you know the sights are out here, you know, the rear sights. You know, the big difference in sight radius. Plus this thing has even a longer barrel than the Author Springfield. Uh, so uh, really uh, attack driver. And it's generally considered the, the rifle that uh, Alvin York, you know, used. He didn't, you know, look at the writings, his diaries and everything. He, he complained about it, in fact, that British rifle, but, but he shot it well. And it's generally considered, I believe, according to current research, you know, if you know differently, let me know. But that's, from, from my reading, uh, this is what he used, his, uh, his famous uh, you know, Medal of Honor act actions and everything. Uh, but uh, so it's a good shooter. Uh, problem I have with it, uh, not to dwell on that, but uh, is the bolt. I, I just despise that turn back bolt dog leg on that because it puts it back here and oh man, right against my knuckle. You know, and I've got to really keep my hand back here because it pops me on the knuckle, the worst place. It's like steel against bone. <laughs> Something to be aware of if you're thinking about buying one of these. But they're neat old rifles, man, the history. Oh man, the history. So 30 out six uh, started out as a 303. You know, it was going to be a 
27 caliber, you know, the Britain's new caliber. War changed everybody's plans. It even changed our plans. It caused us to use a basically a British rifle, didn't it? Uh, but now after the war, this one didn't really continue. Went back to producing Autry Springfields. The, most soldiers preferred it. And this one uh, went, really went out of production. So I guess that tells you something, right? <laughs> Told me something. So a uh, soldier that carried both of these would be well armed. You might think, wow, I'd rather have the 1911 and an Autry Springfield. Yeah, but soldiers carried these, made the best of it, whatever. And then, then too, as I've pointed out before, I think, with a revolver, you know, so many uh, soldiers, if they even had ever shot a handgun, it was probably a revolver, right? Back on the farm, you know? How many <laughs> farm boys or anybody had experience with a semi-automatic pistol before being drafted or going into the military back then? You know, very few. So they might have preferred that, actually. And then a shotgun, of course. Uh, yeah, good old trench gun. Yeah, well, wouldn't you hate it to have been in the trenches in World War One? If you've read much about that, you've seen the movies and everything, whew, it's real, literally hell on earth. It really is. Uh, but, uh, and uh, so anyway, the shotgun, 1897 model, this would have been available. Model, model 12 too as, as, as well, but uh, this particular soldier had access to a, to a model uh, 97, like this one right here. Let's shoot the thing, okay? I even have some paper cartridges here from Federal. Let's try those. If they work okay. Model 97. If there ever was a classic, boy, this is it, isn't it? A lot of so many people have hunted their whole lives with something like this. And this one again started out as a more of a hunting rifle, longer barrel. So I'm not trying to pass it off as a trench gun. All right, well, put a trash can in the way. <laughs> Boom, let's blast this target over here. Now see, there's a the thing you run into. I just ran that bolt back into my hand. So you have to be aware of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with a 97. Or if you're up here like this shooting it, get your nose too close to it. That'd be kind of hard, actually. I would have a pad on there if I shot it much, extender and uh, alleviate some of that, yeah. But great old shotgun, Model 97, uh, a pump. You well know a pump is generally very, very reliable. Uh, pumps I've experienced in my life and, and, you know, cowboy action shooting, the fellow I bought this from, that's what he had used this for for a long time. And watching them in, in competition, shooting them myself in competition, not in cowboy, but in other side matches in USPSA and just whatever. They just tend to work, you know, and that's that's hard to beat in the, in the military. You want things that work, function, and are reliable. And, uh, you know, that would have been, would have been a, a good gun to have. And I'm sure any doughboy that had that, was armed with it, would have been very uh, confident with it. So, so those would be the three that this particular soldier uh, had or had access to. And I think that, uh, you yeah, know, pretty well armed in a very, very, very difficult, you know, situation. Uh, 1917, that same year, could have been three different firearms. We will very likely revisit it, you know, someday in <laughs> a different year. But uh, you know, for 1917, uh, uh, some difficult, very difficult times, uh, the horrors of war or uh, in a lot of ways personified in World War I. Uh, if you're not that familiar with it, you know, study it and, uh, and, and look at what life was like in those trenches and you know, month after month after month you know, in those trenches. Very, very, very difficult. As I say often, it is uh, wonderful for us to be able to experience these pieces of history and basically honor them and honor the men who carried them by uh, enjoying them on a range like this, sharing them, you know, in videos and whatever, and, uh, you know, and not have anybody shoot back at us, you know, while we're enjoying them and not be knee deep in mud and blood as we're having to use them. Uh, but I think it's good that we all keep that in mind and, you know, adds to the, the reverence. I think many of us, all of you and, and us, we have for these firearms like this. Not to overdo it, not to overdo it. They are just pieces of steel and wood 
We can uh, personify them a little too much if we're not careful. Uh, they have no soul. They, you know, they, you know, I talk about gun violence all the time. What a misnomer that is, you know, so I don't want to go too far with that. But, you know, the history is there and we don't want to forget it and, uh, you know, honor the, the people that carry these firearms. And that's the cool thing about these. Now, I don't know about the shotgun, but, you know, this is 1917 right here. Uh, these are not replicas. And this is 1918, you know. So these firearms were very likely, you know, there and uh, carried by somebody, you know, not just on the table, you know, like, you know demonstrating that. So anyway, 1917, uh, whew, uh, I'm glad I was not there. And you probably are, are glad too. I doubt that anybody watching was, right? Because that was a long time ago. So good old 1917 Smith & Wesson. Uh, American Enfield, I'll call it, <laughs> and then Model 97, uh, uh, kind of a look-alike for the trench gun you know, of that time, okay? So, that's just a brief look at 1917, some firearms someone uh, likely had or access to, and uh, happy that we have access to them. We can shoot them and share them with you. Glad you came by. Hope to see you again. Life is good. Oh yeah, that's better. This is a great gun for defense. Oh hey, didn't see you guys there. Uh, while I've got you here, I want to remind you of our friends over at Talon Grips and Ballastall. Talon Grips makes uh, grips, can you believe it, uh, for all different types of firearms. You can get rough texture or more of a rubberized texture. Uh, it just sticks right on there. You know, really affordable, really cool option to in improve the grip for your handguns um, or, or rifles. Uh, so please check them out at TalonGunGrips.com. You'll be glad you did. And also Ballastall, uh, Dad has been using Ballastall for many years. It's a cleaner and a lubricant, and it's non-toxic. Uh, it works really great, and we're happy to have them on board since it's been a part of our shooting endeavor for a very long time. So go to Ballastall.com, TalonGunGrips.com. And also, while you're out there, I'm juggling all these things here. Also, uh, while you're on the internet, please do check out our other social media like Hickok45 on Facebook. There's also Hickok45 on Twitter, the real Hickok45 on Instagram. There's a John underscore Hickok45 on Instagram where I do some things. There's Hickok45.com. Uh, you can find us also on GunStreamer. So check out all that stuff and then watch more videos.